Good morning. My name is John Lane. I'm a climate master. I'm a technical service rep. I give a little background of my uh, experience in the HVAC industry. I started in 1977, graduated from um, one of the schools here in Oklahoma City, and uh, shortly thereafter became a licensed contractor. Did that for about 23 years and then went to work for the ring manufacturing company, uh, one of their distributors here as a uh, technical service counterperson uh, operations manager, so to speak. After that, I uh, was there for about six and a half years and then um, moved over to Climate Master where I've been a technical service rep now for six years uh, with this uh, company. And during that time, uh, I also taught for four years at one of the local Votech schools, uh, air conditioning, heating, and refrigeration, and um, it's brought me to where I'm at today. So <clears throat> having this in mind, we want to do a webinar this morning on uh, water source and geothermal heat pump performance and diagnostics. And in that area, we want to cover four main uh, sections. Uh, number one is the unit performance. Uh, two is the TXV solutions and common problems. Three is re reversing valves and four refrigerant leaks. So having this in mind, we'll get started. Um, this webinar will run for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a 15 minute question and answer period at the end. So uh, we'll get started. once we get past technical difficulties. Okay, uh, steps in diagnostic performance. The first thing we want to remember is some safety rules. With our equipment, we uh, always want to start new units up in the cooling mode at the initial startup. Now, we specifically address this in the installation operation manuals, and we prefer that this be done. This is to drive refrigerant out of the water coils uh, where they may migrate because the coils are generally in the bottom of the units, the refrigeration, refrigerant tends to migrate to the lower end of the refrigeration system. So always start it up in uh, cooling mode uh, on initial startup and if the units have been setting for some period of time, uh, we'd like for you to start these up in the cooling mode. Rule two is uh, once they start up, uh, allow this unit to operate 10 to 15 minutes runtime before collecting any temperatures and pressure data. Uh, this is to allow the unit to reach a, a steady state condition. Um, if you were to take measurements on initial startup without allowing this, uh, those numbers are going to change on you. So give it that 10 to 15 minutes and then take your, your performance information. Rule number three. Um, we want you to perform a heat of extraction or a heat of rejection check. If this unit uh, is performing within 90% of the rated performance, uh, no further checks are necessary and your unit's working properly. Um, all the data information that's in, uh, that you would need to check is in the IOM and that will give you the rated performance and just compare this heat of extraction or heat of rejection to those numbers and we will get to that a little bit later on in the presentation. First, we'll verify unit performance. Now, this is the heat of extraction or the heat of rejection. Now, to do this, you do not need refrigerant gauges. As a matter of, of point here, we prefer you not to use your gauges at all until you have determined that you definitely have a refrigeration problem or refrigerant problem. Um, during the heat of extraction or rejection checks, you will not need those gauges, so do not hook those up. Uh, you will need a water pressure gauge and a clamp-on digital thermometer. And please, uh, we do not like the infrared thermometer, so if you're taking your readings with those, uh, switch to a uh, clamp-on or digital thermometer type. The infrared are not accurate enough for some of these uh, numbers that we'd like to have. Use the pressure temperature or the PT ports uh, if the unit is available, if they're equipped and they are available to you. Uh, if not, you have to uh, substitute just temperature only. And we want you to compare the resultant numbers with published factory catalog data, and those are in the IOMs. Now, what that's going to do for you is it's going to verify 
the equipment performance by measuring the amount of heat that's being rejected or extracted. Water system diagnostics. First, we want you to do uh, a check on the uh, control boards. Make sure that when you first arrive there, you get your information from your your customer. Uh, what is the problem? And then we want you to check that uh, control panel and look at the LEDs on your control board. You'll have a CXM, which is a little small tan colored board, and a DXM, which is a larger green board. The codes on those two boards are identical. There is no difference. If you're experiencing a fault code 2 and you're in the cooling mode, that's going to be a high pressure fault and it's probably going to be due to a water flow issue. By the same token, if you receive a code 4 in the heating mode, this is also a water flow issue. And that's what we're trying to verify is the amount of water we're moving. Also check water temperatures, your delta T. We need that compressor operating to be able to do this. So turn your compressor on at that point and, and let it run for that 10 to 15 minutes, then start taking your numbers. A normal range in cooling for your delta T on your water is between 8 and 14 degrees Fahrenheit. And a normal range in the heating mode for your delta T on your water is 4 to 10 degrees drop. Now remember in the cooling mode, the water is going to rise because we're rejecting heat back into the water. In the heating mode, your temperature of the water is going to drop because we're removing heat from that water. All right, let's look at the formula for doing this. Again, this is what we want you to do. The first thing when you when you arrive on the scene is to get these numbers for you. This this may be a determining factor whether you need to proceed further or not. Q being the BTU per hour, and that formula equals delta T of the water temperature times the gallon of flow gallon per minute times a fluid factor. And we'll cover the fluid factor here in just a moment. Now if you happen to be working on a residential unit, look at the note there. It says always turn the desuperheater or the hot water generator off before checking equipment performance. The reason you need to do this is because the desuperheater actually does take away from the performance of the unit during the heating cycle where we have a call for hot water assistance. Delta T, temperature difference between the entering and leaving water. That's going to be our delta T, and the, you'll always see this symbol right here for that, that measurement. GPM, this is our gallon per minute flow. Uh, it's marked delta P, which equals the pressure differential between the entering water pressure and the leaving water pressure. Now this converts to gallon per minute flow using the pressure drop table for each unit at the correct entering water temperature. Now that will change as the temperature goes. This is why you need to pre refer back to the installation operation manuals. Fluid factor, this is the last equation in our, uh, last number in our equation. It's the ability of a solution to transfer heat in a certain period of time. Now let's look at that formula. We'll set it out on paper. It's very simple. It's easy to do. Uh, you have HE or HR being heat of extraction or heat of rejection equals delta T times gallon per minute flow times the fluid factor. And that number is going to give us a heat of extraction or a heat of rejection BTU number. Now to find the number that you're looking for, what we would want to do is go back to the performance data in the IOM and they've circled a couple of little numbers here. Uh, the, your, if you look there, you have an entering water temperature. This happens to be around 40 degrees. A gallon per minute flow is 9. Pressure drop PSI is 5.4. Now, this is the information that you're going to need when you're doing this water performance check. So let's look at a heating cycle here. This happens to be a Tranquility 3-ton unit, a TTV038. Full load capacity. If you have a, a two-stage unit, we want that unit to be in full stage operation. Also, you'll notice that we have methanol here as an antifreeze, and we're moving 1,250 CFM of air. So the two numbers we're dealing with right now is going to be the water. So we want to come down here and look, and we see that we have a 40-degree Fahrenheit entering water temperature and a 34 degree Fahrenheit leaving water temperature. Just looking at the water temperatures alone without knowing anything else 
you know you're in heating because the, we're, we're pulling heat from that water. So, and we are in heating, of course. Uh, also, we want to see that we have a, a pressure drop. We have an entering water pressure of 45.5 PSI and a leaving water pressure of 40 PSI. So we have a 5.5 pound pressure drop and a six degree temperature drop. All right, let's go back to that performance chart and we'll look. We have a 40 degree entering water, so we're in the right area here, and we have a 5.5 pound drop on our chart, on our, our, on our um, application. And if we look, we see that we're showing a 5.4 pound drop gives us a nine gallon per minute flow rate. And we're at 1250 CFM of air. So let's go back and put those numbers in our equation. So we had a six degree delta T with a nine gallon per minute flow. Okay, now our next part of this equation is gonna be our fluid factor. And when we consider a fluid factor, we always consider water as 500 and antifreeze as 485. Now I know if you look up an antifreeze chart for the fluid factors, you're going to see some slight differences in those numbers. What we've done is we've taken an average of 485. It's easier to remember one number than three or four different numbers. So we will use the 485 number. Remember our, our system had antifreeze in it, so we have an equation now of six degrees delta T. Multiply that times nine gallon per minute flow times our fluid factor, and that's going to give us a heat of extraction of 26,190 BTUs of heat. Now, <clears throat> at this point, we don't really know if this unit is performing uh, as designed or not. We do know we have a three-ton unit and 26,000 BTU, uh, for those of you who recall what uh, BTU is e equivalent to, realize that this is not a full three tons capacity here. So we go back to our page from our performance data and we look at these numbers one more time. Nine gallon per minute flow at a 5.4 pound drop at 1250 CFM. We want to know how much heat we're actually, or how much heat we should be pulling out of this uh, water. So let's slide on over here to our heating section and we look under HE for heat of extraction. And we see at 1250 CFM of airflow, we should be removing 26,800 BTUs of heat. So if we put that in our equation, we see that we have 26,800, and we're actually removing 26,190. Now, if we did the math on this, we'd see that this is 97% of the spec capacity for this piece of equipment. So even though this is rated at nominal three ton, at that entering water temperature, we are removing a sufficient amount of heat, and we are move, removing 97% of the factory data information. Now, anytime that you have 90% of the performance data, in other words, your, your BTU spec, and you are within 90% of that number, this unit is working satisfactorily. If you had a call where the customer said that the unit was not heating as well as it used to, you can show them at this point that the unit is performing as designed there would be no further checks that you would need to check unless you had other issues, uh, say electrical or some other type of problem. All right, let's step on to the thermostatic expansion valve, some solutions to some of the common problems you're gonna run across. First order, let's, let's take a brief review of the basic TXV operation. The sensing bulb's refrigerant charge exerts a pressure on the diaphragm as the bulb's internal pressure changes from temperature variations of the suction line. Now, a good way to think of a TXV is, uh, and its function is possibly the cruise control on your vehicle. As you're needing more fuel to accelerate or to climb a hill, the, the, the uh, cruise control would open up and allow more fuel to flow. Well, the same with the TXV. If you are needing more refrigerant to flow through your system, the temperature of the bulb will change the pressure on the, on the diaphragm, and that in turn will open or close your TXV as needed. 
The diaphragm function is to force the needle to move away from the valve seat to allow, to allow refrigerant to flow. This forces, the, these forces involved in the needle movement are, one, the sensing bulb pressure. We just talked about that. As that temperature changes, it's going to change the pressure in the bulb. The superheat spring pressure, this is generally on our equipment, as factory said, it is not adjustable, but there are some pieces of equipment that we do manufacture, the superheat spring can be adjusted. And three, the external equalizer line, which monitors or is di directly attached to the evaporator. All right, let's take a look at that a little bit. We have a force description here. Number one, we have an opening force. This is the pressure exerted on top of the diaphragm, and this is created by the temperature of the bulb and the refrigerant charge in that bulb. Now, if you have a bulb that you're not moving, then the first thing you want to do is check this, this uh, or I'm sorry, the diaphragm is not, not moving. You want to check this bulb location or possibly even check the, the capillary tube attached to make sure that it's not uh, cracked and has leaked the, the refrigerant charge. Number two, uh, the closing forces. This is the low side refrigerant pressure exerted under the diaphragm via the external equalizer tube. Now, an external equalizer tube is a little bit misleading in the name. It does not allow the pressures to equalize. That is not what it's designed for. It's designed so that the diaphragm can have an, a closing force other than just the spring and where the tube can monitor the pressure within that evaporator coil. Number three, the closing force, of course, is the factory preset superheat spring. Again, our superheat springs are non-adjustable. Don't, don't bother to uh, open them up. They're, they are not going to be adjustable for you. They, some of the large commercial equipment, you can adjust those. But on the, generally on most of the uh, smaller commercial and residential line, they are not adjustable. So let's take a look at these pressures with the rules of movement. Number one, if it's greater than two plus three, that valve is going to move open. In other words, if this pressure here exerting down is greater than these two pressures here pushing back up, this valve is going to move away or push, come open and move the needle away from the seat at this point and allow refrigerant to flow. If number one is less than two plus three, then this valve is going to close because our pressure here is less than the combined pressure of these two elements here which is going to force that needle to go back into the seat, which is going to restrict the flow of refrigerant. And number one is, is what we call a steady state. This is when it equals two plus three. This valve, wherever it is opened at, in other words, if this is moved down, the needle has moved from the seat, and the pr pressures become equal, that needle is going to sit at that position and allow refrigerant to flow at a steady rate. Now this is why we want you to allow this unit to sit or run for 10 to 15 minutes so that the TXV can stabilize and this refrigerant flow can, can meter to a steady flow. TXV issues, number one, will not feed enough refrigerant. If the TXV is adjustment stem, this of course, we talked about that just a few moments ago, the stem is generally at a 50% open or midway point except on some of the units that are non-adjustable. That midway point is still in effect, it's just not movable. Okay, if you do have a commercial unit and you are needing to change a superheat, <clears throat> which is, is sometimes you have to do this in the field, most you techs are aware of this, to increase the superheat you want to turn the stem clockwise. This will decrease the refrigerant flow. This is going to add more pressure to the spring, which in turn is going to close the needle to the seat. To decrease the superheat or to allow more refrigerant to flow, turn the stem counterclockwise, same method as you did to, to increase the superheat. You're just going to reverse the turn. This is going to open up the needle, and move it away from the seat, and you'll get more refrigerant flow that way. All right, check sensing bulb location and tightness. Now, this seems to be sometimes an issue um, when we don't get enough refrigerant movement or refrigerant flow. You want to make sure that the sensing bulb is fastened securely. Uh, all, all of our smaller equipment uh, from probably six tons down and smaller, that sensing bulb is going to be attached almost directly coming right out of the compressor on the suction line, usually within six to ten inches from the compressor itself. 
The preferred attachment is to a horizontal run-up tubing. If these tubing is 7 eighths or larger, the bulb should be attached in a 4 or 8 o'clock position. A smaller tubing can be attached anywhere around the tube except on the bottom. The reason we don't want you to attach a sensing bulb to the bottom of the tube is refrigeration oil acts as an insulator to the bulb. If the bulb can't be attached horizontally, you can attach it on a vertical or a descending vertical run of copper. But do not attach it to the bottom or the 6 o'clock position on any copper line. The bulb should be attached to a clean section of tubing. Now, <clears throat> when you start to get some of the issues with the fluctuations on your bulbs or on your suction pressures, check that bulb and make sure that corrosion has not occurred underneath or there's something preventing the bulb from making a good solid contact with the suction line. This is an issue that we see occasionally where someone has replaced a TXB or they've removed the TXB, the sensing bulb, reattached it, it's not attached tightly or the copper tubing is, is not clean. The bulb should be isolated from the ambient air. Do not leave this bulb exposed to ambient air temperatures. It will not sense the correct temperature of the refrigerant coming back to the compressor. This is what's giving us our proper reading and metering of refrigerant as long as that bulb can sense this suction temperature. Check for moisture and non-condensables. The symptoms are uh, Number one is frost can be forming on the TXB body. You want to be very careful and look for this. <clears throat> if you can't see it, run your hand over it and feel of the body of the TXB. If you feel a slight forming of frost on it, then more than likely we have a, a, a bit of moisture in here or some non condensables that's causing it to form a little ice at the metering point. Pressure continuously fluctuating or the TXB is hunting. Most of us have experienced this. Anytime you have one that will not stabilize after a 10 to 15 minute run time, it's a good idea to uh, remove the refrigerant, pull a deep vacuum on it, and check for non-condensables. Valves will not stabilize after a normal run time. Um, that's another issue that you'd have. At that point when you have a valve that won't stabilize, again, look for a non-condensable situation. Uh, TXB flooding a coil. And obviously, this is one that is stuck in the open position, or it's possibly uh, the sensing bulb is is not working. However, you won't see that with a flooded coil very often. Only times you would see that if it was uh, stuck in the open position and you lost the bulb charge. The spring pressure should close that needle up to the valve seat. Okay, if moisture is indicated, now what we recommend at the factory here is a deep 500 micron vacuum. It must be pulled on the unit to remove any moisture, especially with the new 410A refrigerants. Um, you have to pull a vacuum of 500 microns or better. Now, this micron, this, this vacuum should be pulled for a minimum of one hour after the micron gauge reaches 500 microns or lower. I've seen multiple times where you, in the field, and the technician will pull the vacuum down to 500 microns. And when it hits 500 microns, he terminates the vacuum. That is not what we're looking for. We want you to hold that vacuum at 500 microns or lower for one hour minimum. How did this moisture get into the system? Um, a lot of people think that it was in there during the manufacturing process, but that's not necessarily true. The filter dryer may be at its maximum moisture retention. In other words, if the filter dryer can hold and is able to collect and retain uh, three ounces of moisture, and we have uh, four ounces of moisture in that system, that dryer will give up that extra ounce of moisture and allow it to flow through the, the refrigeration system. It will not retain it. So a dryer's retention uh, capabilities is important. Now, another thing uh, that we, we have found uh, during installation of dryers, when you heat a dryer up uh, that has been in the system for a while and it's, and it's reached its close or close to its maximum retention capabilities and you, re you heat this dryer up, it releases moisture back into the refrigeration system. As your liquid line temperature increases, the additional heat 
can cause this dryer to release this moisture into the system. So when you have a very hot liquid line, uh, when you're brazing or soldering close to a, a dryer, filter dryer, you can cause that dryer to release the moisture that it's already re already retained. My suggestion is, and what I practice in the field is, I always cut the old dryer out. I do not use a torch. You cut that dryer out to avoid raising the temperature of that and releasing moisture back into your system. Contaminants in the system. Dirt or other materials such as copper oxide scale from brazing, metal chips, even oil breakdown that turns into sludge, uh, all these things are contaminants in the system and must be considered whenever you have a TXV issue. Now, in the beginning, we, we talked about the bulb pressures. If you obviously walk out there and see a, a broken capillary tube to your expansion valve, you know that valve is not going to operate. At this point, uh, it's bad, so we remove it. But contaminant in the refrigeration system is another another problem that you're not going to be able to readily see. And this is another reason for installation of the filter dryers in the liquid line with the TXV. This will help prevent, particularly from entering into the valve seat of the TXV, preventing the proper metering. Uh, we can't stress enough on any time that you open this system up, even for short periods of time, that you replace this filter dryer. Now, a suggestion that I would make is when you do replace the filter dryer, so a, lot, a lot of times you're going to need to replace it again after a few running uh, hours. So if you can make it where you put in a flare fitting dryer, it's quicker and simpler to remove and replace than having to pull out the brazing equipment. And plus, by using the, the flare fitting dryer, you do not recontaminate your copper tubing with oxides and so forth. It keeps the system as clean as possible, and this is what we're after. Consistent flow of liquid refrigerant is another issue that we see with TXVs. The TXV has got to have a consistent flow of, a li of liquid refrigerant to allow it to work properly. When you don't have the liquid entering this TXV, it cannot meter properly, and so you're going to get a lot of flash gas and improper metering. Superheat and subcooling, uh, what do they tell us? Are they important to know? We consider them very critical on our equipment. We need to know superheat and subcooling, and they're very important. Uh, they tell us what is going on within the refrigeration circuits. They tell us where our refrigerant is, what it's doing, what state of refrigerant it is. Uh, we all know that we have uh, different states of refrigerant uh, during the refrigeration process. At any given point in the refrigeration circuit, we should know what state that refrigerant is. Is it a vapor? Is it a liquid? Is it uh, flashing? We need to know what the refrigerant's doing. They tell us where the refrigerant is and what it's doing. The super, high superheat tells us there is a low refrigerant level in the evaporator, or we might call this in a starved evaporator. This is going to give us a high superheat number, and it's very important to know this. Whenever we have a high superheat number, we're going to have high discharge or a high temperature gas returning back to our compressor. Now, this, uh, this can uh, cause overheating of the compressor and eventually uh, opening of the internal overload and so forth and so on. Low superheat tells us that there is an excess of refrigerant in the evaporator and that we could be put back to the compressor. Now, we are finding quite a bit of this, uh, and you have to be very careful with this equipment because here's the issue with the low superheat is that because we have short copper runs in the geothermal systems, there is no room for or no additional uh, superheat to the copper lines. We're talking copper line runs of 18 inches or less, and therefore there is no added superheat once, it, uh, once the refrigerant leaves the evaporator. So what that does, it floods back to the compressor, washes the bearings, and uh, with due time we have compressor failure uh, due to uh, lack of lubrication and the parts are worn. High subcooling advises us that there is an excessive amount of refrigerant in the condensing portion. Now this can be caused by a bad TXV, could be caused by an overcharge. Uh, different reasons can give us this, this um, high subcooling levels, a uh, restriction. Um, 
So when we have that, we want to look for those conditions. The low subcooling lets us know that there is an insufficient amount of refrigerant in the condenser. Uh, this would probably be a in good indication of a, uh, a low charge. Uh, maybe the TXV is, is stuck open. Um, so these numbers, the superheat and subcooling numbers, are very important uh, in troubleshooting this equipment. Let's take a look at the, uh, the piping diagram of one of our pieces of equipment. Now this is just a, uh, obviously just a generic type diagram, but we have a lot of issues with technicians in the field not knowing where to take superheat and subcooling readings on our equipment due to the fact that we're not using a, a typical air-to-air -air setup. Uh, superheat equals the suction line temperature <coughs> minus the saturation temperature. Those gauges need to be attached to the suction line and the digital thermometer within probably six inches of the compressor. Now, some of these units may take a little bit, uh, have a little bit longer suction line uh, we'd like for you to be within within 10 inches, no further away than 10 inches of that suction line. Take your digital thermometer, get your reading, and then convert this to superheat. Subcooling, the liquid line temperature minus the high pressure saturation temperature. Again, you would you would connect your gauges to the discharge port. Now, the discharge port on this equipment. A lot of the packaged equipment is going to be nothing more than a Schrader that's located, and it could be located actually on the discharge line of the compressor. So instead of looking for that a liquid line port, look for a Schrader valve that's on the discharge line. On the suction side, always look in the center tube on the reversing valve. This is where this Schrader will be located. Now to get your temperatures on the liquid line, depending on the mode of operation you're in, would be where you want to attach your thermometer. This diagram is showing that we are in the heating cycle, and we want to come out here and find out this is our heating liquid line. This is where you want to attach your digital thermometer to get your subcooling for your heating cycle. This is our liquid line, our TXV here. Now, if we change this cycle uh, to a cooling cycle, your liquid line is going to be on the opposite side of the expansion device or the TXV. This will be your liquid line and it's coming out of your condenser coil at this point, which will be your water coax. Remember that's in the cooling mode. It would attach between the water coil or your, your temperature thermometer would attach between the water coil and the TXV. Okay, <clears throat> superheat and subcooling, if we are in the heating mode, and we're going to look at some of this here and just see what kind of a charge we would have or what we would, would be the results of the superheat and the subcooling. In the heating mode, if you had a normal superheat and subcooling, your charge is probably going to be correct. You would not need to adjust that charge. If you had a, a superheat that was normal and a subcooling that was high, we would have an overcharge. We just talked about that. If you saw a high subcooling number, um, you're, you're going to see an overcharge situation here. Remember, your TXV is going to try to maintain a normal superheat, even if you have an overcharge. Now, if you're grossly overcharged, it may not be able to do that. But a, a, a few ounce overcharge, you may see this situation where you have a normal superheat, high subcooling. Just know that you have an overcharge situation here. If you had a high superheat and a low subcooling, it'd be the, of course, be the exact opposite. Uh, we're not getting enough refrigerant through our TXV, and uh, so our evaporator or our air coil is running a higher temperature than normal, a starved situation, so to speak. And you would have a low subcooling simply because there's nothing there for the compressor to pump, pump uh, to the uh, expansion device. So this would give an indication that we had an undercharge. Now let's look at the cooling mode. In the cooling mode on our equipment, we use one TXV. If you have the same situation here, you're going to have a normal superheat, normal subcooling, you're going to have a proper charge. And all the same again uh, in the heating cycle that we'd have in cooling cycle, you have normal superheat, high subcooling. It's a good indication we have an overcharge situation. Same with the undercharge, you'd have a higher superheat, 
and a low subcooling. Now the only difference that you're going to find is if you was go out, do your superheat subcooling checks, and determine that both were high. Uh, this is a dead giveaway for a bad metering device. Uh, anytime you have both of these situations high, you're going to see this uh, this TXV is probably inoperative. All right, let's look at some reversing valves. <clears throat> this is a uh, photograph of a typical reversing valve. Here you have the discharge line coming into one side. Uh, the valve body itself, brass. Uh, you'll have the pilot tubes, feeder tubes on both sides. This can either be, depending on the uh, application and depending on how you're running your lines, this could be either a discharge line um, or a, a suction line. This could be a discharge line or a suction line. The center tube is always suction, always. Under all operating modes, it is suction. It should always be cool to the touch. All right, reversing valves, let's, let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, this is what we call a touch test chart. Uh, the, the valve operating condition, uh, number one, being the discharge tube from the compressor. Uh, number two is a suction tube to the compressor. Number three, the tube inside to the inside coil. Number four, tube to the outside coil. And course five and six are your left and right pilot capillary tubes. Now these, these tubes will tell you a lot of how this valve is operating. A touch test is literally what just what it says. You use your hand to lay on the copper lines to test them to see what the temperature of the, uh, the lines are, are during the operation of this unit. So let's look again here. We have a discharge line, and, and by the way, be careful with the discharge because we all know that this can run high temperature. But you can tap it with your finger and, and feel the temperature slightly there without having to get burned. We want to be able to feel this. Now let's say that we're going to send this tube or this refrigerant, uh, let's call it we're in the heating mode. And during the heating mode, of course, again, we have one of these lines is a discharge line, and two are the suction line. So we have, let's, let's just use this, uh, since it's straight through, we'll use this as our discharge line. If I was to feel of this line here during the heating mode, it should be the same temperature as this line. If we feel a temperature difference across this, then this valve may or may not be fully open. We want to check our charge. We should have no more than a four degree drop across this, this between the discharge line and the leaving discharge line. Now, if you have a seven degree drop, or let me say a seven degree difference or greater, then that reversing valve is bad. It is not sliding and will probably, probably need to be replaced. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Discharge tube, normal cooling. Now, this is in both modes of operation. Our discharge tube is hot, obviously, in both heating and cooling. Our suction tube to the compressor is both cool, heating and cooling. But we look here and we see that the tube to the inside coil is as cool as number two. So if you were to touch that small tube, it should be as cool as the suction tube is. In other words, your pilot tube to the inside coil should be as cool as the suction line tube is. Same with the main tube. That tube should be as cool as the suction line, the center tube. Now, in the heating mode, the suction line, again, I remember I said it's always a common suction in the middle. That should be as cool as it normally is in the cooling. But the other tube in the heat mode will be as hot as the discharge line. So in the heating mode, we're going to see a difference. Cooling, they stayed the same. Now let's look into the, uh, the tube going to the outside coil. Your pilot tube and your main tube should be as hot as number one, which is our discharge tube. In the cooling mode, that should be just as hot as the discharge tube. In the heating mode, however, we're going to change this. The tube to the outside coil now is as cool as the suction line. So if we were to touch this line, it would be as cool as the center line or our common suction line. Now the TVB, which is the temperature of the valve body, this is the body of your smaller capillary tubes. This is the pilot tubes. Okay, when a reversing valve needs replacing, 
After the touch test has been performed and the valve has been determined to be inoperative, this is the time you need to replace it. Now, <clears throat> again, the, the touch test is just to give you an idea, is this valve actually working or not? It will not tell you to the full extent if the slide is moving all the way over. It will not tell you if, it will tell you if it's leaking slightly or if it's not leaking. Remember, the, the temperature cannot be any more than four degrees between the entering discharge line and the leaving line. In the case of the reversing valve and the suction side, those two temperatures of both valves, or I'm sorry, both tubes should be the same. In other words, your center tube being a common return line or back pressure line should be the same as the other suction line that's coming into the reversing valve. After you do this touch test and the valve you determined that it needs to replace or it's inoperative, replace it. Do not try to repair it. You cannot repair this valve. Uh, don't bang on the valve. All you're going to do is damage it even further. Um, do not tap on it. It's very soft brass. If it is determined to be inoperative, replace it. The guide to replacing this valve is, is, is something that is all technicians tend to uh, dread doing and it's not that difficult. The problem is it's, it's very tedious in the fact that you have to protect the new valve from damage during the brazing process. Use small tubing cutter to cut each line four to six inches out from the initial swedged braze joint of the RV. This will make it easier to install a new valve. Measure the length of the tubing that was cut and is still inside the reversing valve. In other words, if you cut a three inch, if you cut back three inches from your swedge or your braze joint, allow an extra inch so you've got a four inch piece of copper you're going to need to cut. You can cut the cop pieces of copper to the correct diameter and length that was removed from your valve. Okay, swedge one end of this copper piece that were cut that was cut to place into the reversing valve tubes. The swedge end is where you will attach the reversing valve to the refrigerant system. Using a heat absorbing paste and a cold wet cloth. Now a lot of guys will use just the paste or a wet cloth. We recommend using both. You wrap this valve and keep it wet during the brazing process. Get you a container of water and every, and every now and then pour a little water back on this valve during this brazing process to keep it as cool as possible. Remember that the internal slide in this valve is a neoprene plastic and it will melt um, with excessive heat, so you have to be very careful. Now what we're talking about is right here. If you cut this valve out, you move from this point, move about three inches away from that point and make your cuts on all three or on this side. And on this side, on the discharge side, uh, probably two to three inches is, is sufficient. Uh, it's smaller tubing, so you're not going to need the, the, as much heat to braze that back in. But so when you cut this valve out, you're going to have about, instead of these three inch ports here, you're going to have about six inch ports, part of it being the copper tubing that you cut back. We like to uh, suggest that when you do braze this valve back in position, you want to braze these copper tubes back in that you have cut and made uh, to place in the, uh, the swedged section of your valve. You stand this valve up on the uh, end so that whenever you do braze, the alloy flows in a downward direction into the uh, swedged area. This will be easier for the person brazing to observe uh, this process, plus you can watch the, the, uh, the alloy as it flows around the brazing joint and it makes it easier to keep it cooler while you're outside the machine. Do not braze it into the machine at this point. Um, the one thing that we, we do discourage you from using is a turbo torch. The turbo torch is fine for large areas where you have a lot of room to work, uh, where you don't have um, a chance of creating too much heat on another uh, component part. Um, we prefer that you use an oxygen acetylene torch and this way you can direct more heat in a tighter area that you would not uh, not be able to do this with a turbo torch. I know a lot of you guys in the field because they're less expensive use turbo torches but a preferred method is not to use that when you're brazing in a reversing valve. 
The oxygen settling ports can be directed to a smaller area with greater heat. Uh, this will keep more heat at the brace site and reduce the conductive heat that is being absorbed by the copper into the reversing valves. Uh, you can pinpoint your heat, uh, in other words. Once this tubing pieces are brazed into the reversing valve, you may then reconnect the reversing valve to the refrigerant system and braze into place. Again, use uh, new heat absorbing paste. Do not try to use the old paste. Clean it off and put new paste on and a wet cloth keeping it wet and use the oxy settling torch. But once this is done, get your valve in, then your reversing valve is ready to be connected electrically and should operate. Let's take a look at the refrigerant leaks. Um, leaks are, are, a, are difficult, to say the least, to find a lot of times. Uh, we've, we've all been out in the field where we've worked hours upon hours trying to locate leaks, and they're just difficult things to find if they're very minute. So <clears throat> some of the methods that we uh, use here in the plant uh, when we have items sent back to us, uh, for inspection, uh, we use these methods to, to see if we can locate leaks. Um, we're going to cover these, and so what we first do is we look for an obvious sign of refrigerant leak. Uh, we pressurize it and listen for a hissing sound coming from our unit. Uh, if it's a large leak, you should be able to hear this with uh, some high pressure nitrogen from the pressure about um, 250, 300 pounds, you should be able to hear it with a sufficient leak. Oil on the copper tubing or on the component parts. That's a giveaway for a, a leak in that particular area. Look for leaks in bins and flared copper. Uh, anytime you flare copper, you, you thin the walls of that copper. And, and also the same with bending copper. Those walls are thinned and they can tend to leak at times. Check for leaks at the Schrader valves. A lot of people overlook these valves. That's just a very small um, spring in there that holds that valve shut and they can leak. Check the caps on all Schraders and make sure that their O-rings are still inside the cap, and if they're not, place O-rings in them and then put the caps back on the Schraders. Check your braze joints between dissimilar metals, steel to copper connections, especially at water coil connections. Check joints on filter dryers and mufflers. Uh, these are places that, that, because they're swedged copper, they tend to be thinner, and they, this is where a lot of the leaks occur. Now, use electronic leak detectors as well as the bubbles to locate leaks. Um, when you, if you are going to use electronic detectors, block all your air drafts, and, as this keeps the detector from picking up the refrigerant leak from the unit. I know we've all been out in the field where we have a draft blowing, and sure enough, uh, you pass over a leak simply because the, the leak was blown away by the, the draft. If necessary, isolate sections of the unit if you need to section. Isolate a water set. I mean, a um, a indoor coil section. Then brace it shut, pressurize it, check for leaks in that area. Move on to the next section until you find the section that's got the leak. Okay. Use. Um, well, I think we just backed up there. Okay. I think we're here, ready for questions. Okay. Um, David Newens asked. Why are we getting these reversing valves stuck in the middle position? Um, David, those reversing valves, a lot of times, if they're if they're sticking in the in the um, middle position, uh, we can verify that simply with that touch uh, the, the touch test. Um, most of the time, when a reversing valve is stuck like that, it's it's uh, either low on a charge or we've got some debris in one of the pilot tubes. Um, if you're in the cooling mode, you can turn the, um, well, let's, let's put it in the heating mode. It's easier in the heating mode, actually, to, to raise the head pressure. Turn the water flow off and raise your head pressure in the heat mode and, and try to increase the pressure within that system. And then uh, apply 24 volts a couple times to the reversing valve. Don't go through the control board because if you do, that, it has a slight delay in it. It's easier just to put 24 volts directly to the reversing valve coil and see if we can break it loose that way. If it's not, if it will not break loose that way, then the valve has obviously got to be replaced. It's, uh, it, it's in that position. Leif, we should be able to hear you now if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. 
Okay. Uh, my question is related to the ground uh, loop on a water-to-water -water system. I was recently working on a system that uh, it had zero PSI on the ground loop itself, which where the uh, the uh, pressure relief is is the highest point of the ground loop system. So I was wondering if it's ever advised to run at zero PSI, or is there just a leak in the system that I need to add some water? Did you pressurize it to start with? We did not do the original fill of the ground loop system. We had a uh, mechanical contractor install that aspect of it. Okay. Um, there are systems out there that will operate with the zero pressure. Uh, there's different types of pumps that will, will allow you to do that. We, I don't think we sell any at this time, but uh, there are some manufacturers that do produce pumps. They're actually called flow centers, GT flow centers. They will allow you to use a zero pressure loop. Now, it's not really a, a total zero pressure. There is a slight pressure simply because anytime you move water, we have to have a differential in pressure. Right. But uh, you can use what we term as a zero pressure loop uh, on some of the smaller smaller loops uh, up to like five ton systems, something like this. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a dual four ton system that yeah. it was running on. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's got the bladder tank and it's ready for the expansion of the water. Obviously, when you're in the cooling mode, it's going to be heating that water. It's going to rise a little bit as far as pressure. Yeah. Uh, in the well, heating... Remember, yeah, remember that uh, we're, we're not necessarily looking for the amount of pressure in the system. What we're looking for is the differential in that pressure. To diagnose issues, correct. Right. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I guess I, I had to take I, a... I had to take a a sample, a of, this sample water. of this water. And the only way to do it was to run the pump, and that's the only way any water would even come out of the pressure relief. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in that case, if you're if you're not getting water to move with a zero pressure system, I would probably have somebody come out and pressurize it and work with, a, I'll say, 20-pound pressure different, or, you, know, you know, pumping in 20-pound, not necessarily your differential. But uh, I think a lot of the loops uh, now are running around 50-pound pressure. Um, but like I, again, like I say, the main thing is to get the pressure differential across the coax coil, not necessarily pressurizing the loop. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's just for diagnosing the energy transfer. It is, but it's also uh, moving the water. You're still moving the water even though you're not under a pressure, so to speak. Right. Is there any reason you would not want to run 10 psi just? If for no other reason than to rule out leaks, um, no, not, not necessarily. Um, so if you have leaks in there, you're going to be dropping that pressure. You're not going to be able to maintain any kind of pressure with it. So, in, in that case, you would you, you may want to revert to a zero pressure system. Obviously, though, when you do that, you're going to have to continuously add water at some time. Right. So I guess. There's no way to really tell because it is common to <clears throat> occasionally run a zero pressure system. I can pressurize this one and just keep it at that. But if you're leaking, no, you will not be able to keep it at pressure. Does that answer your question, Dave? Say again. Did that, was that, did that answer your question? I I think so. Okay. Mark, to answer your question, this webinar uh, presentation will be available online on CM DealerNet. Uh, we're recording this entire presentation, so the audio and video will be available to uh, 